Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WDIC, WRPT in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Tina Olson, Executive Director of Mending the Sacred Hoop, who has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Tina, for joining us today. You're welcome. So Mending the Sacred Hoop, first, from the perspective of somebody who is largely ig ignorant of Native culture, what is the sacred hoop? Well, it comes from a prophecy um, from a man named Black Elk. Our history is very complex and based on the colonization, the genocide, and the assimilation of tribes in this country, Black Elk made a prophecy that'll take seven generations to erase all the violence, the dysfunction, the genocide. And in that seven generation, children will be born that will be able to address and correct the wrongs that were done to them. So we took that prophecy and we named it into our organization because our organization works on a lot of issues that are important and impactful to tribes and tribal people across the country. So the sacred hoop is a image of renewal, Yes. but renewal takes time, renewal takes effort, renewal takes attention. Talk about how you are converting time into impact that is healing. Well, our primary work is educating both Native and non-Native communities on a national level, a local level, and even on a global level. Um, we have the highest rates of domestic violence, the highest rates of sexual assault, the highest rates of youth suicide, the highest rates of murder, poverty, unemployment, alcoholism, diabetes, and we weren't born this way. So it's a long history of understanding trauma, relocation, genocide, to really educate communities on where we are today. We are funded by the Department of Justice, Office of Against Violence Against Women, to go into tribal communities who are funded by the Department of Justice and help them to develop a response, whether it be a law enforcement response or build a better woman shelter or organize a tribal court. The challenge is, is there are 573 federally recognized tribes in this country, all with varying resources and um, land bases and the lack of infrastructure. So the challenge is pretty heavy. In Alaska, there are over 200. Um, they're not called tribes, they're called villages. Native villages, and they are, um, they're not considered Indian country. So in, in as much as they're not, the legislation that comes through the feds with the Violence Against Women Act and Title IX that was passed, affect them differently. Like, this is an example, they have over 200 villages and they've been living there since a millennium. They have less than half of their villages, maybe a third of their villages, have tribal village safety police officers. They carry no guns. They don't have, they have old like um, sheds or mobile homes that act as places to incarcerate them and hold them till the state, Alaska State Patrol comes along. And yet they have the highest rates of violence in those villages, highest rates of alcoholism that gets brought in, highest uh, rates of suicide. And finally, these issues are being covered. We are, you're beginning to see exactly this issue in Alaska being covered by the media, um, but through years of neglect, and, and also a, a reluctance at a certain point, there, there has been a bit of a pause in the violence um, and in the neglect and in the uh, sometimes paternalistic efforts to uh, provide help that was misinformed. Um, and I think now we're getting to the point where just through dialogue, there is information, valuable information being exchanged so that people who are largely ignorant on certain aspects of, of the challenge that is being confronted, people like myself, can finally be informed for, uh, by people like your, yourself. Yeah, most of our work is educating our native communities and governments. You know, there's this myth about who we are as a people. Well, let's just take Duluth, for example. In the response for law enforcement, we respond to domestic violence and sexual assault case. A lot of our people suffer from addiction. A lot of them are homeless. And um, when 
when a woman, like a homeless woman who had may been drinking, reports a sexual assault, they'll take her to detox, not always take her to a medical facility because they look at the alcohol first right. and the addiction and not what led her to that addiction. What kind of trauma is buried deep below layer upon layer that um, where she chooses to drink because she's blocking all that stuff out? And it's always a, a fight against public perception of who we are as people. I've, I've got four grown daughters. You don't hear a whole lot about, we're in the helping fields. I've got an attorney for a daughter, a school teacher for a daughter, a nurse for a daughter, and a social worker for a daughter. But you don't see that. We're not portrayed as much out there in the public mm -hmm. as being professional, as being articulate, educated. I mean, that's one of our challenges. It's also one of our barriers, public perception of who we are. You know, we're not just homeless. We're homeless for a reason. We're not going to be able to address a lot of these issues that are going to help our community until we address the issues of poverty, unemployment, and addiction also. Well, in many respects, what you're doing is you're recreating the culture that you need today. Any culture is creating, its, is creating and recreating itself all the time. But in the, in the aftermath of such destruction, where there are still places of knowledge and there are still elders who, who uh, have memory and even the people who have forgotten, the fact that they know that they've forgotten and in themselves create the will to recreate and learn, that is a life-affirming act. And what you're doing is you as a community are reestablishing this knowledge and also you're creating the traditions of the future. Well, I wouldn't say creating. I would say restoring. Restoring. Restoring the traditions. And a part of restoring the, in the traditions is some of our elders, especially, I mean, I've been Alaska about 10 different times and all over. I've been to every state in this country except maybe four on the East Coast and, and in Alaska. But giving permission for elders to remember their values is the hardest thing because this country taught them to forget, made them forget, punished them if they spoke their language, punished them in treaties that were created. They didn't want to deal with women and our leaders said, where are your women? They wanted to deal with men only. But the thing that burns in my memory the most and is real hard to accept and is sad is that the history of this country promoted and said men were the leaders in your, in your families. We make treaties with men. Families who had land also assimilated and copied that and took their land and their sons inherited it, not the women who inherited it. They gave it to their sons. So the Bakken oil fields, I have a, a friend named Karen whose brother got all the land and she got nothing from the land. Their father had willed it to the boys, not the girls. And they get a per capita payment from the oil that's being taken out of there on a monthly basis. And her brother does not know how to deal with that kind of money and has been rolled, has been taken advantage of, drinks all the time. Meanwhile, Karen has to go bail out of it, jail and go visit her. That is a direct impact of what happened in history for women. That's a disrespect for women and the fact that we are not promoting or keeping the values that women should be respected. They're life givers. But that happens today. It's not happening in the past. Now you also have a, a program, the, tech, uh, the Training and Technical Assistance to Tribal Governments program. Mm -hmm. Talk about that program. What is the content of that and what do you hope to achieve? As you know, the United States has a special relationship with tribes across the country negotiated in treaties a long time ago. They're responsible for health, education, um, different things. When the Violence Against Women Act was passed, there was a small portion of funding that went to a tribal set aside. It was like 12 tribes out of 573 who got funding to develop programming to combat domestic violence. Over the course of years and time, it's increased tremendously. But the funding goes to tribal governments because they're the entity, they're sovereign nations. And when they apply for funding and they get funded, there's certain things they promise to do. 
And so either train law enforcement, either create a tribal court that addresses domestic violence, whatever it is. What we do is we're funded by the Department of Justice, Office of Justice Fund, to help tribal governments and their programs establish shelters or transitional housing or a tribal code that addresses sexual assault and domestic violence. So you act as a kind of an information clearinghouse mm -hmm. of how to, it, when they receive the funding, mm -hmm. so now they have a, a, a bucket of cash and they, they, they must use that cash in certain ways and you help as an information clearinghouse to shape programs that would be appropriate to fulfill the requirements of the federal government that came with the grant. Right. So if you're, if you're speaking to two different groups, one is the diverse native communities, and you're saying, my friends, we need to do this. And if you were to speak with non-native communities, people like myself, and you were to say, my friends, we need to, we need to do this, what would you say to the first community and what would you say to the second community? To the first group, I would say, I wouldn't say what they need to do. I would first go into the community and find out what their traditions and their practices and their community are. Because we've had enough of people coming into a community and telling them what to do. Well, the first, so the first thing you would say is respect yourself, learn and explore your own traditions. Right. And, and I'd get to know what that community's tradition is, and then I'd bring in my knowledge that I have in, com in combination with their traditions and point out a way, a cause and effect. With the other group, I would ask them to immerse themselves, learn more about the diversity of tribal nations, and um, go and visit these nations, and be true and transparent and honest with yourself. The U.S. Attorney of the United States about a year ago went to Alaska. They heard all of this, this stuff that was coming out of Alaska about the disparity of Alaska Native women not getting treated right. And they went to villages. They went and went. And he was so appalled by it, the U.S. Attorney. He came back. And they found money, millions of dollars, to create more tribal police, more law enforcement in those villages, because he went there and he saw it. It's the same thing I would ask somebody here. Go and visit the Oglala Nation or Rosebud or a Pueblo in South Dakota or the Wampanoags, you know. Um, go visit them. Tina Olson, thank you so much for sharing the fantastic work of Mending the Sacred Hoop. Thank you so much for bringing to uh, the, the eyes of someone who um, is, is partly blind to the lives and traditions and cultures of Native peoples here, some new intelligence, and thank you so much for thank your you insights. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much.